Oh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Brian Martindale. I'm the HVAC uh, faculty here, full-time faculty. And um, I, I just want to thank our panelists. I want to thank uh, Kristen and her team, and all of you, of course, for being here. So without you guys, this wouldn't happen. So uh, I really appreciate you taking your time to be here. And uh, just a little bit, I'm not going to spend much time about myself, but uh, I've been here with uh, Washington Community College since 2010, and I've been in the industry since 1988, and uh, uh, it's been a great career, and it, hopefully it will be for, for many of you as well. Um, so with no further ado, thank you. So uh, we're going to spend a, a short time just getting to introduce our panelists. Um, at the very end, we're going to have a question and answer session as well, so you'll be able to ask them uh, questions uh, in the panel. Um, but for now, what I'd like uh, them to take about three minutes each and then just do an introduction of who they are, uh, how long they've been in business, uh, uh, education, uh, the different education that they may have had. Um, so if we could start, well, let's go from left to right with Brynn if you'd want to. Um, Introduce yourself. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening, everybody. My name is Brent Cooksey. Um, I've been in the industry about 20 years. I started in the industry as a uh, as a tyke. I was um, forced into enslavement by my father to join him on service calls, as most of you probably are as well. Um, I absolutely enjoy the business. Like I said, been in, in the business 20 years. I personally own Air Doctors Heating and Cooling. Um, residential contractor here in uh, Southeast Michigan. I'm one of Brian's peers, also teach here at the campus. Definitely an exciting experience here. And um, I think we'll have some good information to give to you all about starting a business. So thanks for having me. We'll see you, see you in a bit. Thanks, Brian. Um, Mike Bergstrom, uh, Thornton & Grooms. Uh, we're located in Oakland County, uh, so a little bit down the road. Uh, I grew up in the industry just like Bryn did. Uh, my dad, I remember Christmases, uh, we did inventory. I remember counting <laughs> fittings. And uh, he used slave labor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, we, uh, I have two other partners. We own a business. Uh, we purchased the business uh, 17 years ago. Uh, so, and uh, we are a residential HVAC and plumbing company. And we do. Uh, um, repair and replacement of, uh, of uh, that type of stuff and uh, yeah so thanks Mike thanks. Uh, good evening my name is John Boylan I'm the general manager at Lakeside Service Heating and Cooling and uh, like these two gentlemen here I was enlisted at about five years old <laughs> I spent my holidays putting stamps on mailers um, but it's a great industry and uh, we do residential and light commercial HVAC and plumbing um, you know, you guys are in a really great spot. This is a great career to get into if this is really what you want to do. Uh, this is a great school. I've looked at a lot of different programs when we're recruiting and what Brian and the staff here, what they do, the value that you get here is incredible. So I'll tell you right now that as an employer, when I'm, when I'm recruiting and someone comes in from this program, I definitely look at them a lot with a lot more sincerity about their commitment to what they're doing because you guys aren't in just a, you know, a, you, you pay a little fee and then you take a two-week class and you get a certificate. I mean, they're, they're teaching you great skills and we have, uh, I think one of my team members is here tonight. Where are you at, Billy? Yep, Bill. Bill's a great team member. He's done a great job and I appreciate you guys for having us up here. It's a, it's a good opportunity. I'm looking forward to talking to you a little bit about how to market and how to communicate with customers and then how to keep them once you got them. So, thank you. Very, very welcome. Um, so, uh, our next step is going to be for me to introduce again Bryn, and he's going to do a presentation on uh, steps towards opening a business and MBE minority uh, business owner cert certification. So, uh, again, if we can give uh, Bryn a round of applause. Here. All right. So steps to steps to opening a business. All right, the American dream. All right. Like I said, uh, owner of Air Doctors, um, a lot of this presentation is going to come from my document um, by RCS. You'll see it listed on the bottom. Um, Kristen has it on the ERR website also. 
it's uh, basically steps to operating a business. So I'm going to reference that document quite a bit in this presentation. All right, I personally attended Henry Ford Community College and Fair State University, but to mimic what John said, this is the absolute best school around. Hands down, I agree with him 100%. Not just because I work here. It really is a, a great place to be. All right. So, why do you want to get in business? Anybody? I'm interactive, so I'll ask questions. Why do you want to get in business? Yep. To control the, your, your schedule and your time and the customers you interact with. Yep, absolutely control your life. Yep. We'll find out later, maybe not so much, but <laughs> later. <laughs> you, sir? For me, I'm a facility uh, engineer, so it's, again, our biggest issue is the engagement across the building. Okay. I'll more about that, so being a team uh, of a facility is, is necessary. Okay. All right, any other? Let's take one more. Yep, John? I love helping people. I do, too. Yep. Uh, it's funny. I didn't hear money, and that's, uh, that's interesting. We'll talk about that here in a minute. All right, so are you an entrepreneur? All right, entrepreneur is defined as someone who takes an initiative in organizing and managing a business venture and who assumes financial risk for doing so. All right, are you an entrepreneur? Like we said, increasing your personal income, all right, that's a, maybe a motivating factor for a business. All right, controlling your life, like you said, doing significant work, helping people. All right, those are things, those are gut instinct things that an entrepreneur needs to have. All right, here's some skills you have to have or possess. You have to be a self-starter, all right? As an entrepreneur, you gotta get out the bed and do stuff even when you don't want to, all right? You have good planning skills, organizational skills. Can you manage your time effectively, all right? Can you multitask? Can you manage people and equipment? Um, are you qualified to work in industry? You're coming here to college to gain that technical expertise, but there's some aspects of the business that you may not have the training. Are you qualified to be in that part of the industry? And as my counterparts would say, you're always in school. All right, you gotta make a commitment to learning. All right, you're never gonna stop learning. All right, so are you ready? Are you ready emotionally? My counterparts would say, we'll have some bad days where all right, make you want to throw in a towel. You're going to get crazy customers. You'll be dealing with situations that you may not deal with if you're not an entrepreneur. So are you ready for that? That's a big responsibility that you have to burn. Right? Does your family support you? Right? It's a huge undertaking. Do you have the family support that you need? Also, are you financially ready? All right? Having a business is a significant investment in many ways, and it takes a lot. All right? Financially, if you're thinking about starting a business, here's some practical steps. First of all, take care of your debt. If you have any kind of lingering debt and you're really serious about getting into the business, all right, take care of any lingering debt that you may have. It's going to make life easier. Most financial people will tell you to have six months savings. I'll tell you, you want to be an entrepreneur, you should make that cushion double, maybe a year. All right? Our business has some highs and lows that you have to figure out how to market and eliminate those or make them least, least impactful as possible. So starting out, you need to be prepared. All right, when you want to purchase equipment, getting started, most banks are gonna reference your personal credit to get you business assets. All right, so you need that to be as high as possible. But before you get into the game, you gotta make sure you have at least these things ready to go for you. All right, so you're financially ready, you believe, you're emotionally ready, but you got your family support. Now what do you do? All right, you gotta get a game plan. All right, creating a business plan. Our folks in the ERI department have many, many wonderful resources for you to take advantage of creating a business plan. Here's what your business plan should consist of. Uh, industry synopsis. All right, what kind of trends for your competitors, what kind of industry sales are in that, in that? You need to go in and put a game plan and understand exactly what you're getting into. All right, who's your customer? So Jacob's customer, and you vary from Ryan's customer. All right, who's your customer? Who are you interested in doing business with? All right, that's a trick question. Many people will say, well, everybody. 
everybody is not your customer. So you have to understand who your customer is. All right. What's your competitive advantage? All right. What makes Mike good at what he does? What makes John good at what he does? They have a competitive advantage. They have thriving, successful companies with great reputations. How did they get that? Right? They have a competitive advantage. All right. John's going to talk about your marketing plan. If you know your customer, you got to figure out how to market to them. Some other things. How are you going to structure your plan? All right. What's your sales strategy? How are you going to price yourself? All right. Financial plan. How are you going to fund your business? These are all things you need to start thinking about prior to taking that commitment. All right. Your business plan should be detailed. It should be in writing. You should think about all these things before you launch your business. Or if you already started your business, this is something you should stop and take a look and hash this out. It's going to make life easier. All right. Once you hash out what your business plan is, what are you going to call yourself? All right. Why is a business name important? A business name important is because if a customer can identify that business name, they need to be able to know what your business does. All right. So, real important, you don't want to look like your competitor. All right. Have a couple of choices that you want to think about. You don't want to make a name that's hard to spell or hard to search, all right? That's uh, especially with the internet these days, all right? You want to avoid referencing an area if you're not going to stay in that area. If you localize yourself, many customers may not choose to do business with you, all right? And do some research. Avoid anything that will be offensive in another language, all right? Once you get your business name established, what kind of logo, what kind of branding are you going to have? All right, when customers see your name and they see your logo, does it indicate that you're in this particular business? So here's some, some valuable insight. Want to stay away from your competitors. Right? Want to have multiple choices, get it designed. And a logo should be eye-popping and catch your customer's attention. All right? Who's your customer? Who's your customer? So, as a service tech, who here works in the field? All right, Bill, when you go out on your jobs, who are you engaging with the most? Homeowners. Homeowners, particularly who? Uh, the and most of the time. Most of the time is who? Male to house, female to house. Okay, all right. There's Reports and all kinds of statistics that show typically when HVAC or any service provider inter interchanges with the homeowner is usually the woman of the house, all right? So, here's a thought. Maybe you should do some research on your logo, maybe appealing to that particular person. So that, that might be your customer, all right? All right, just food for thought. <laughs> How are you gonna set your business up? What kind of organizational structure? All right, all of these, and we won't cover them, but they have different advantages as far as liability and taxation. All right, so you have to do your digging to see which one is going to be best for your particular situation. They include sole proprietorships, partnerships, SC corporations, or LLCs. All right, which one is best for you? All right. Now, here's a sobering thought, and the dean mentioned it when he was up there. A large percentage of businesses fail within the first five years, right? 20% fail in the first, 30% fail in the second, 50 after five, 70% after 10. A statistic is taken from, from their, their business funding corporation, all right? When we talk about the HVAC industry, we're three on the chart as compared to restaurants and retail stores. So out of those three businesses, those business classifications, our business has the highest failure rate, all right? So that's why we're here. This wonderful campus has put all these different resources here together to make sure you're not a part of that statistic. All right, please use it, all right? So with that in mind, how do you plan for your business to end? Knowing that your business is gonna end somehow, you preferably want it to end on a positive side, you sell your business. 
you pass it on to your inheritance. Right? Find a buyer, pass it on to family, go public. That's real successful. All right. Close or liquidate. You maybe don't want to do it anymore. Die with the business or go bankrupt. All right. Somehow, some way, your business is going to end. All right. You get to choose, hopefully. All right. You want to stay on the positive side of things. All right. So, to decide how your business ends, you need to plan for success. All right. There are several things you can do. Number one, the peer group. Peer groups and trade associations. These are organizations designed to hold you accountable. All right, you can participate into them, and you have other business owners in your area or maybe across the country that are going to help you be successful. All right, we'll talk about those in a minute. So peer groups and trade associations. The dean mentioned business training. I've been in the business a long time, and my technical skills are not beneficial to me, as you think they should. It's business skills. How do I communicate with people? How do I communicate with an upside customer? How do I get the best out of my employees? All right, business training. All right. And then rely on your experts. All right. Utilize the accountants, the bookkeepers, the tax preparers, the marketing firms. Rely on those. Don't DIY this stuff. Rely on the experts to help you become successful. All right. Once you get to this point and you want to start to consider funding your business, one big no-no is to stay away from your retirement accounts. All right? Find another means to fund your business. All right? Nowadays, crowdfunding is really popular. You're at your barbecue in the summertime, you find your buddies, hey, I'm looking to launch Pete's HVAC business, I need some help, All right? maybe some crowdfunding. Many people have done that before, it's successful. Credit unions actually tend to be a little bit easier to deal with than banks. If you frequent a local credit union, you have a well-written business plan, you may be able to get some funding, all right? Fundera is another organization. They specialize in helping businesses get funded. With Fundera, they're even uh, handy to the point where if you don't have any business credit established or you don't have any funding whatsoever, they can find banks to help you work, to work with you, all right? So after funding, you got to see what your advantages are. In the military, vets in the, in the room today? All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right. You can take advantage of a certification. All right. Small business certifications exist because there are some groups that you can take advantage of these different certifications. One of the benefits of having certifications increase recognition I reduce my competition. I get preferential treatment. That's always good. All right. I get set aside contracts where they have to deal with me. I get increased revenue, and I get actually increased opportunities for funding. All right. Here are some of these certifications. Some big ones. Veteran-owned small businesses. All right. You get your documentation together, and you go to the SBA. You apply for your veteran-owned certification. Once you get that certification, it will give you the ability to compete in different bidding opportunities that a non-veteran typically can't get that same opportunity with, all right? Competitive advantage, all right? Women-owned businesses, same thing. And then minority, all right? Any minority business, all right? Get your paperwork together, contact the MBE. They have a chamber right here in Detroit, downtown Detroit. Submit your paperwork, and they can actually help you get MBE certified. What does that do for you? You get into a corporation where they get maybe tax deferred dollars to spend with you, all right? Competitive advantage, really important. All right. Usually when you go to apply for any of these certifications, right, you're gonna need your documentation in hand. They're gonna have you visit their website. You're gonna apply. They're going to take you to a meeting, and they're going to walk you through specifically what you need to do. You're going to need to know if you're a veteran, you're going to need your discharge papers, you need your proof of citizenship, and any kind of other kind of business documents. <laughs> so other kind of business documents, how was your business formed? All right, if you were LLC, your articles of organization, you're going to need to have those in hand when you go to apply. All right, 
Once you attend those meetings and they walk you through the specific steps, and you submit your documentation, then they check that documentation, then you get granted with your certification to have you pay a fee. Okay. Here's some trade associations. These trade associations are just a few. All right. AFTA, Air Conditioning Contractors of America. You have Service Roundtable, Service Nation Alliance, Next Star Network. These are all groups and organizations designed to help contractors be successful. All right. So um, while you're working on your business, a lot of times you benefit from, from networking, networking with other contractors, all right, and they can help you along. All right. I have this problem. If John is a few years ahead of me, he's experienced this problem, he's crossed that bridge, and he can help me through that problem. All right. So you have help in addition to what the campus is giving you. These are really three really important books. If you want to start a business, these are books you should read. Know where to come. All right, not only read them, implement them. Reread read them. Take notes. One of the best books ever, The E-Myth, Why Small Businesses Fail and What to Do About It. Absolutely an amazing book right? by Michael Gerber. More specifically, HVAC Spells Wealth by Ron Smith. Another awesome book. And then how to communicate with people, how to get the best, how to make friends, how to influence friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie. All right, three books that you should pull out, buy them on Amazon tonight, and start thumbing through them. Right, so one thing we do at the Entrepreneurship Center is we have entrepreneurs in residence. And that means, oh, I can take this off. <laughs> that means it's so unusual to take it off. That means that we have nine entrepreneurs and residents who are practitioners. They're already out there running businesses. They, they're active running their businesses. But they give us a few sessions each month for all of our clients who come in and need help. So we have an entrepreneur and residents who works with veteran business owners. Um, an entrepreneur and residents who works with people who want to talk about marketing. Um, somebody who works with people in the food industry. And those people are all experts. They're doing their thing. They're running businesses. And they like to give back and help. Um, just like all of these panelists, right? I mean, they're running businesses, teaching, um, but they're here and they're giving us their time. So uh, there's just certain people we found along the way, entrepreneurs especially, who love to give back. They love to teach and, and help other entrepreneurs come up. Um, so this program is really great, and you can meet with any of those if you come and talk to us and you, you, know, you need really help with marketing at this point. We might lead you to the person who, uh, the entrepreneur in residence who works with people on their marketing plans. Um, but what we did with this, this funding we got is that we created an entrepreneur in residence position just for HVA students, and that's Bryn. So on this one side of this card, you can see that you can meet with Bryn, and it's free virtual sessions. So they're 40 minutes. We have about six sessions a month. So there's plenty of space, and he'll do this through about the end of May. Um, and you can just meet with him virtually via Zoom and say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about running a business, or I'm taking over my family business, and what are some things I should be thinking about? He's not an academic advisor like Nikki Lee. Do you all know Nikki Lee? You get emails from her. So she's the one you want to talk to about which courses to take, and you know, your academic plan and all that. But Brent can talk to you about contracting, about um, running a business, about thinking about running a business. You may be way far away from that, but it's just, you know, you can, you can have a good session and talk those ideas through. So that's what is there. And you email us first at the Entrepreneurship Center. So that's our address. It's crazy long. I didn't make it up. It was here when I started. So you got to spell out entrepreneurship at wccnet.edu. And that's how you reach us. And then we can get you to an appointment with Fred. Um, Mike, um, uh, when he said that he was going to uh, uh, contribute, that he would be able to uh, uh, take part in this, I actually uh, asked him for to do a specific presentation. Um, I actually worked for Mike as a service technician for about three years, and um, we would have training. That was one thing really great about Thornton and Grooms is all the training that, that they would give you, not only technical, but about um, communicating, communicating with customers and so forth. Uh, but he did one presentation that really stuck with me, and it was pretty much about what it takes to put a truck on the road the financial cost of putting a truck out on the road. And, um, and I just also want to give you a heads up, we're going to do a little bit of an interactive activity with this as well. So, um, so he'll be sharing that with you. So uh, if we can give uh, Mike Bergstrom a round of applause.
So right. thank, thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Yeah. What an opportunity. I mean, the passion that Kristen has around business. Uh, I went to Michigan State and graduated with a business degree, and I, I don't even think they had uh, a resource even close to that um, to, to be able to support you guys in whatever endeavor you wanted to do, whether that was business or, or just, uh, you know, like Brian said, building a, a, some type of website for uh, promoting yourself. Um, so, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Uh, wanted to introduce myself a little bit. I did a little bit earlier, but uh, um, I am general manager and partner of our business. Uh, I've been in the HVAC plumbing industry for 25 years. Uh, 17 years owning a business, and I have two other partners in the business uh, that, that uh, we operate with. Um, that is my lovely family, um, and uh, I have three three young children that, that keep me busy. Um, Company-wise, uh, we started, uh, we purchased the business in 2004, uh, was 10 employees, including myself and my brother, and uh, today we're at 225 employees, we do residential repair and replacement on HVAC and plumbing. So it's been a fun ride uh, growing the business, and uh, Brian uh, was a great employee while he was with us and, and loved working with him. And, and, uh, thanks for having me, Brian. Um, I want to share you a little bit about my passion. Uh, my passion is to be ever building the professionalism, integrity, and honor of the trades. So one reason I'm here tonight because you guys are the future of the trades and it's so awesome to see a group pursuing the trades it's an awesome career it is something that we will always need uh, and without HVAC there is about 30% of the country that we could not live in you think about Arizona you think about Florida the deep south, without air conditioning, it would be virtually impossible to live there. Without plumbing, we would not have indoor plumbing. And the sanitation, uh, that is what makes us a first world country. Without sanitation, we are a third world country. So oftentimes, this is looked at as a second career or something that is lower than people who go to a college and get a four year degree. I want to flip that. Without us doing the things that we do, this nation would not be where it's at today. So thank you for pursuing this career, and thank you for the faculty here who make this a more professional, honorable trade. So um, what, what we're going to do today, what Brian asked me to come and do, is what's called a one truck <coughs> exercise. So we're, all, we're going to start four different businesses. Uh, here today. So uh, the assumptions we're going to make is that you run a small shop, you have a you have family health insurance, and you stop working at 40 hours, right? We stop working at 40 hours every week, right? Every week. <laughs> <laughs> and you have two weeks vacation. Uh, so those are the assumptions we're going to make. So if, if we think about it, if you work 40 hours a week for 52 weeks, that's just over 2,000 hours. So if you take that Two weeks vacation, that is 2,000 hours a year that you are working. Uh, so this is going to be a typical work day for us. And so oftentimes when we think about work in this industry, we're like, we work eight hours, we get paid for eight hours, right? Well, that's not necessarily how it works, especially running your own business as a one-man shop, right? So if you arrive at the shop, schedule your day, return some phone calls, you gotta go get a part. So it's nine o'clock before you even arrive at the first customer's house. So you arrive there, you sell them an hour's worth of work. And this could be a commercial situation too, right? I mean, commercial, residential, uh, very similar in the amount of hours you bill. Uh, so you get past that customer, you return some more phone calls, you're on your way to the next one. By the time you wrap up there, you sell a couple hours worth of work, take a late lunch, then you return some phone calls, go to the supply house because you need some parts, go to the next customer, and then you go home and you got to return an angry customer's call, you got to meet with the yellow page rep, you got to do the paperwork, 
And uh, all said and done, out of that eight hours you worked, you built four hours. So about half the time. And that would be a really good day. That would be a, I knocked it out of the park today. So that's what I want us to think about, is that about 50% of the time, we're going to be billing uh, the customer for what we do. So uh, if we think about that, how many billable hours would we be billing for in a year? So a thousand, right? 50%. So uh, four a day, 20 a week, a thousand a year. You guys are quick. I love it. I just came up with a list myself of all the things that are on our P&L statement. So uh, I saw owner salary up there a lot. An answering service, computers, donations, gasoline, insurance, legal, payroll, on and on and on. All of these things that our customer ultimately has to pay for. Um, so uh, what I'd like is, what did, there's a wide range of salaries. So uh, what, was, what was the salary here? We were 75,000. 75? 50,000. 50,000. We said 100. 100. Five guys at 250. <laughs> 250. All right, all right. So a wide range. Uh, you can make what you want to make, right? I mean, you're, you're the business owner. So um, what I'd like to do is, what did, did you guys get a chance to get your totals? Yeah. All right. Well, how about... Uh, we start over here, and we'll, we'll give you a little bit of time to, to calculate that. What do you, what do you have here? 553000 for the years. $553,000. So we're looking at about $47,000 a month for you know, fixed overhead. Fixed overhead. All right. Casey? Very, very rough, $172,000. $172,000. All right. We took ours in a one-man truck. Um, one hundred thousand on the dollar. Total hours spent is one hundred and sixty-three. Okay. Thank you. I mean, we were we were one man shop too. We we came up about one hundred twenty-five thousand. One hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. There is no wrong answer here. This was a ten-minute exercise, so it is what it is. Um, what what we want to establish here is that we don't set our price based on what our competitor is, right? We have a very wide ranging number of expenses here based on the business, based on what you want to earn, uh, based on how you advertise, um, based on how hard you want to work. Um, so, you know, setting your price based on somebody else's cost is not, it's a way to go out of business. There's a reason that Bryn shared that 70% of businesses go under in our industry in the first 10 years and 50% go out in less than five years. It's not because of lack of business. There are plenty of calls out there. There are plenty of needs out there. It is a lack of understanding of what our expenses are and how we calculate our price. Brent, Brent shared about needing 12 months of expenses. I remember a time in our business, uh, right around when Brian was there, there was an eight month period I didn't take a paycheck home. I had to go to my dad and my other partner's dad and borrow hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep the business afloat because I didn't know these expenses and I didn't keep track of them. So it's really important to understand and know your numbers to, to be able to run a successful business. So what I want to do is sort of calculate, if we just take, we'll say the average of this is about 150,000, okay? What is 150,000 divided by 1,000? Pretty easy number. 100, 100, 150 bucks? Mm -hmm. per, uh, per billable hour. 
So those four hours that we build, we need to be billing those at $150 an hour if our expenses are $150,000 a year. Does that make, mm -hmm. am I making sense? How many contractors do you think are at 150? Do you think that's the majority are above that or below that? Below that. So, and, and there were, this is a quick 10 minute exercise of you coming up with expenses, right? I mean, if, if I go back to that list of the page before, there's a lot that um, we probably didn't think about or, or could be blindsided for us um, that, that we just don't think about. So, and that's just to break even. Um, you're taking a salary home, but you're taking a risk as a business owner to open a business. What if uh, that furnace you installed, one of your employees or yourself accidentally forgot to put the plug in the gas valve after you tested the gas pressure? That furnace comes on, the gas is leaking, and it sets the house on fire. And there's risk in what we do and, and the things that we do. So we actually have to have a profit above that to account for the risk and then also to invest in our business. Say we wanted to hire another employee, we'd have to buy a truck, we'd have to buy the stock for the vehicle, uh, we'd have to, to train them. So all those expenses have to be paid for and to be able to have the money to do that, we need to, to make a profit. So above this 150, I can take this off. <laughs> We need to make a profit. So the average contracting business makes a profit of 3%. Uh, not a very healthy profit. Uh, actually isn't a profit um, because of that risk and the other monies that we have to pay for things. A, a healthy business is operating in the 10 plus percent profit range. So you add another 10% on top of that, now we're closer and higher, closer to that $200 mark. So what, what I'm trying to get, help you guys understand is, one, if you wanted to go into business for yourself, make sure that you calculate your expenses and create your, your, your billable hour based on what your expenses are. Two, if you go work for somebody, understand that it's expensive to be in business and to do this. And you know, they're not paying, they're not charging $200 an hour, and if you're getting paid $30 an hour, they're not taking that other $170 home. Uh, there's all those expenses they have to pay to be able to cover their business. Um, so uh, I wanna thank you guys. You guys did great work. Uh, these are some great lists that you guys came up with. Uh, appreciate your time, and uh, go out there and make this a better industry. Uh, thank you. And our uh, last panelist, uh, John Boylan, and he's going to uh, be discussing uh, marketing and getting customers. So let's give uh, John a round of applause. Have you guys ever used the masks by the door? Yeah. You find out you got a big they don't fit around your head. <laughs> Get it off. All right. Well, thank you for having me here tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I didn't realize I actually got to do a slideshow presentation for this, so it's kind of exciting. I put it together this afternoon. I, what I want to bring to you guys tonight, I don't want to bring you what you can learn in a book about marketing. You know, we could talk about uh, where you could spend your money. You know, you can talk about Google paid search, what the newest thing's going to be. It's, all, that's, it's constantly changing, um, and there's always going to be new forms of media that you can just spend money on. But as you just saw from you know both of them in their presentation, uh, you know, you can spend it pretty quick. There's a lot of things you got you can spend your money on. And so so what I want to do is I want to give you something of value. So if I, if I were to go back to when I was you know getting started or when I was trying you know trying to grow the company, there's some just basic stuff that is uh, it's incredibly valuable and um, 
Market, marketing isn't exactly, it's, I mean, it's not advertising. Advertising is just a piece of it. So uh, moving forward with this, which way do I press this to put it? There we go. So this is my working definition of marketing. It's every and any form of communication that you perform that interacts with a potential or existing client where you get to demonstrate your value or your services that you provide. So it's, it's everything that you do. It's certainly not just an advertisement. An advertisement is important. Uh, if you need a call to action, if you're trying to get a specific product to move, you do have to communicate that. But ma marketing is more than that. It's, uh, it's the experience that you create for each of your customers or your potential customers. Oops. This is going to be fun. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to tell a little story uh, to kind of ex paint a picture for what I mean. So back in the 1980s, there were two hamburger, co uh, hamburger companies, hamburger restaurants, okay? They both provided a very similar product. Uh, they were both targeting the exact same customers. Uh, one might have had even a slightly better product, a better burger than the other one. For, for everything except for, I mean, they had a different, they each had their own logo, they each had their own, you know, little thing, but they weren't really, there was not anything significantly different about each other. So, one of them, the one that I think had the better burger, they had a really great TV campaign. It, I mean, it was funny, had this little old lady who would go around saying, where's the beef? Everybody talked about it, laughed about it. It was, it was a fantastic commercial. The other company had commercials. Uh, they also had a big TV campaign with a, a clown and some really strange friends. They were always around kids. Uh, it was very bizarre. But that was their approach. So, I, I mean, when I look at that, if I was to analyze their actual their market or their advertising campaign, the Where's the Beef was way better. It connected with people. They thought it was funny. There were people saying it to each other all the time. It was great. So the interesting thing about that is uh, the, the Where's the Beef people, with the, well, they had a better hamburger by far. There was something that the other company had that they didn't think of. And they both sell food, OK? So it's, they're, they're both in the food industry. They're both restaurants. The other company, the one with the weird creep the clown with, with the kids, <laughs> even though their customer was you and me, adults, they came up with this idea to put the food in a little cardboard box and put a toy in it that cost less than a nickel. And this was called a Happy Meal. Okay? So the other, the other company didn't think anything of it. They had their great commercial, and they, you know, they had a superior product, and they'd make it the way you wanted it to. They thought, there's, you know, we, we've got this. The other company, uh, just I don't know if they did it intentionally or stumbled across it by luck, this little toy, which they're not a toy company. They don't sell toys. They didn't make the toys. had nothing to do with them. Parents started going to that restaurant just because their kids would want this toy. So, and if you could imagine the importance of this, if you've ever been to a McDonald's with kids in your car, and you get three Happy Meals, and one of them's missing the toy, I got the food I paid for, but you know what, I'm going back for that toy. Because there's a fight happening in my back seat. It's, and it's a toy that I'm gonna throw away tomorrow, because it's gonna be on the floor somewhere, and no one's gonna want it, but the idea is the genius of their marketing was they created an experience for their customers that nobody really looked at very closely from their competition's point of view because they're like, well, we don't sell toys. We make a better hamburger. That didn't, that didn't matter to them. So now you've got, uh, I think uh, Burger King is worth maybe $876 million in net revenue. And I have to actually look because it's such a high number. But McDonald's is crushing the industry with uh, $4.73 in net profit, selling, you know, little packets of food in a cardboard box with a, a garbage toy, right? That's just it. Like, each of us in our industry, 
we, have, we can find things that we do that the other guy doesn't do. So one of the key elements of marketing is to differentiate yourself and provide value and communicate that to your customers. So what I want you to think about today is because when you get out there, and now some of you may be in business for yourselves, some of you may go work for someone else, or some of you guys may actually want to do the entrepreneurial spirit that Brennan's talking about. If you want to do that, you got to be smart and you got to innovate ways to stick out from the guys like, and I, I'll say brand names, the Randazzos, the family heating and coolings, you know, the, the guys that are spending many millions of dollars on television commercials and print advertising and all the traditional media that, you're, you, know, that you see. You don't need that. You definitely don't need it to get started, and you don't even need it to be successful. You can, when you get to that point, you can use it because there's some great tools there that you can use to expand your business and get reach more customers. But in the beginning, marketing is everything that you do that communicates who you are, what you do, and what your value is to your customers. So instead of thinking about ads or radio or television or even Google, or Porch, or uh, Angie's List, or all these places that want a piece of your profit, right? That's what they want. They want, they'll tell you they're gonna grow your company. And if you just pay them a monthly fee and an X amount of every sale. And as you see, all of that stuff's coming out of your sale too. So whatever you spend in marketing, whatever you want your salary to be at the end, which is really the leftovers after everybody else gets theirs, as you know, Mike was just saying, Whatever you can save in marketing is what you get to keep. So what I, what I would like you to think about are things like your process, okay? How you look. Do you wear you know, name badges when you go out to meet people or when you go out to meet your customer? Do you cover your shoes or take them off when you go inside someone's home? Because each of those things is the toy in the happy room. It's the thing that maybe the other guy doesn't do that that customer immediately feels like you respected them better or you gave them an experience that they wanted to have. Because everyone wants the same experience, right? We, want, we all want to be like the medallion members on the Delta Airlines where you get the special room and you get free food. And you get all the, they want to be treated like that. That's what everyone wants. So I want, to, I want to throw some ideas out at you about how you can create that Happy Meal experience with your clients, potentially. So creating your brand. Your brand is more, so much more than your. Did I do it again? <laughs> All right. Oh, how do I do this without going? Oh, here. Nobody look. <laughs> you know what? I can do it from back here. Glenn. Oh, I got it. I did it. <laughs> All right. So your brand. Your brand is so much more than a logo. Your logo is important. Okay. And I'm not, but I'm not up here to tell you how to make a logo. Your logo needs to be something that's personal to you, that's something that you, know, you connect with, that you think uh, stands out, displays your face, all those things. I will say, don't make your logo really complicated. You don't want someone to drive by, see your logo, and have to read it as you're trying to you know, go by. You want them to just see it and know what it is, but that's not what your brand is, okay? Your brand, your brand is, your brand is your story, all right? Your brand is what you believe in, okay? Uh, what you say is important, but what you do says so much more for you. So think of things, when, you're, when, you're, when you get that first customer, when you get your first tune-up or your first sale, think about when you go to their house, what could you do to demonstrate you respect them and you're a professional? Some of the things that we do at our company, if you have an appointment with us, our technicians, our salespeople, our installers, they all call when they're on their way, and then they ask, would you, where would you like me to park? Okay? Something so simple. I guarantee you most companies don't ask permission for where to park before they go to someone's house. Because what that's going to show them is they may, they may say, you know, will you park out by the mailbox because my wife has to get out to go to work while we're doing this appointment or vice versa or the kids are coming home from school, whatever it might be. It's, it's such a little thing that costs you zero dollars, but the other three guys that were coming out for that sales call, none of them said that. So already you're different. Your brand is now sticking out. You've differentiated yourself. Cost you nothing. In fact, it might make it... It might make it even easier when you get there because they kind of like you a little bit more. Okay? 
The next thing that you can do is do what they said. If they said park, you know, hey, park just past the garbage on the left hand, do exactly what they said. And when you do that, now your brand is a brand they can trust. Because the very first commitment you made with them, aside from being there on time, which you always have to be where you're going on time, it's, it's these little things subconsciously that when they see your logo in the future, they're going to associate with those experiences, right? There's a, there are so many things you can do. You can create things that we've never thought of, right? Because you've all, take the best place to grow your brand or grow the way that you're going to differentiate your brand is from your own experiences, good and or bad, right? Take something that you went through a purchase with where you, someone really got on your skin. You know, don't ever do that to somebody. In fact, think of ways to prevent that and, and uh, alleviate that before you get somewhere. Every time a customer contacts us, they're usually in some form of stress. You know, they've got anxiety because you're a stranger going to their house. And everything that you do to lower that level of anxiety is going to increase the possibility that you'll be successful, that you'll sell a higher service ticket or sell more products when you're in their home because you're constantly earning their trust. So, so that's, that's a big part of your brain. It has nothing to do with the logo. It has to do with the story that you tell through your behavior. And then that logo will become associated with those feelings and that trust and that experience. On, on, a, on the other side of that coin, you do have your logo. Okay? So when you're actually talking about the branding that you create, so it's, the, it's, uh, it's your logo, it's the slogan, it's your mission statement, it's all the things that you, uh, that you actually print and publish and express that you want people to read. Okay? There's something that at Lakeside we call brand perfection, or at least I call it brand perfection, and that is put it on everything, right? Uh, you can ask Bill. How, you know, Bill needs a t-shirt. Bill needs a hat. Bill needs a hoodie. Bill, you know, whatever he wants. We've got branded stuff for him to wear. It's on your invoices, your service tickets. It's on your business card. It's on your vehicle. Um, you know, it can, you know, you can now... If, if you are smart enough to lay drop cloths down when you're in someone's home so that you don't accidentally drop anything, you can get screen printed drop cloths with your logo on it. And see, that's, it doesn't cost that much money, right? But if you go into someone's house and you're, you got your, you, whatever your uniform is and it's got the logo, it's clean, that's another thing. You want your brand image to be clean. If you're a technician or an installer, carry an extra shirt. Because your first call, you might get pretty dirty. And you want that first impression on your second call to be as good as you can. So always have a spare set of you know, whatever your button-up is that you're going to wear on the outside. But it, when, when a client sees your, your brand on everything that you do, it immediately gives them the impression that you're bigger than you are. Even though you just, all you did is you spent an extra $10 to get a screen print on the drop cloth. But... It, get, it gives them that impression of you just, you're put together, you've got, you've got every, everything's connected and it's, it's in harmony with them. So all of these things that we call branding are about creating a consistent image of quality, professionalism, to build trust in your logo, your brand, and who you are. And if you do this really well, when you bring on new people, when you expand your team and you add to it, and you put that logo on them, not only will they have seen you demonstrate it, so they'll walk straighter and they'll, they'll, they'll replicate that, but people will start to trust other people that wear your brand just because of what you put into it and the, and the, the um, consistency and the experience, okay? Consistency is super important in building your brand. So important. So if you do something special for Mrs. Smith on, you know, on State Street and she refers you to somebody over on Washington, and you did something for Mrs. Smith that you thought would be nice. It's not necessarily part of your process, but you did it. Did something nice for her, and you don't do it for the next person that she referred him to. You're going to get a break in that, and you and you lose some of that equity that you invested in because they want the same experience that Mrs. Smith had. And this is really simple stuff. But what I'm getting at here is all these things that you're going to do. You need to create a process, which is your brand. And this is a part of your marketing strategy, okay? It's about um, so that you can replicate it 
And you want to do this from the beginning. When you're just working on your own, there's no better time than to create good processes than when you're, when you're first starting out. Because once you've got you know, 10 guys, or you've got 50 guys, or you've got 220 guys, it is a lot harder to start going back and saying, hey guys, I got this great idea. Now we're gonna put these special booth covers on, and we're you know, and it's it's you just it's impossible to get it. But if when you're building a brand and you've got a company where this process is in place that demonstrates that professionalism, and a new person comes into that environment and everybody else is doing it, if they just get right in line and do it like everyone else, it's just like the military. You will not see someone in the military standing a little bit off to the side from everybody else at a different angle. It just doesn't happen. I mean, they've got instructors that make sure of that, but they're, still, it's, you, everybody wants to, wants to be fit into that image. That's called brand perfection. When your brand is so perfected that when, when somebody sees your logo, they immediately think of all those things, you, that's, that's, when you're, that's, that's, that's successful. Like that, will, that will create something that people talk about and they recognize. So... Bryn talked a little bit about you need to know your customer, okay? I'm just going to keep it broad. There are so many niches you can get into this industry. Like if you're going commercial, there's refrigeration. There, you know, there's just so many angles you can go. But basically, there's two big categories, which they're commercial and residential. My company is about 95% residential. We do commercial work, but it's not a ton. But there's very distinct different ways to market and communicate to commercial customers than there are to residential customers. And I'm specifically going to talk about when you're getting started. So I'll tell you a story about how my dad got started. Because he was he worked for Cook and White here in Ann Arbor back in the 70s. And then uh, in the 80s, uh, early, early 80s, the um, economy took a dip, quite a dip. Uh, they actually started reducing people's wages. So, you know, you got to take a $2 hour pay cut or whatever it was. So my dad thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for myself. And I won't get into that whole story, but I will say that when he did that, he actually would knock on doors and offer tune-ups, which I don't, I mean, that's a, that's a tough way to do it. You want to talk about an entrepreneur, talk to my dad sometime about what he was willing to do to make sure that he didn't fall into that 70% category. Well, in commercial, you, you can solicit yourself to people that you're doing business with. It's, it's an interesting thing. Like if you buy things from somebody, it's almost like a permission slip to talk about what you do. Mostly because they want your money and they want you to keep coming back, but you got the door open while you're there. So one of the things that I've seen work successfully is let's say when you're going home, let's say you stop at the, the local market or whatever it is, or a convenience store. Strike up conversations with the people that you're, that, you're, that you're interacting with. You know, let them know what you do, okay? And don't expect anything right away, but just start to build those relationships and plant those seeds. Because one day, you're going to be in that store, and you're going to notice one of their coolers has no lights on and all the products gone. Because that cooler failed. And what's going to, every store owner goes through, every, every convenience store owner goes through this. And they lose all that product. They have insurance for it. Sometimes they might not claim it, but... That's just loss, right? When you see that, just just let them know. Hey, I know your cooler's out. You know, like yeah, you know, just lost. It's the third time it's been out this month. Every time it goes out, I lose all my ice cream. Just tell them, hey, you want me to take a look at that? You know, the, well, I got I got a guy. Well, you know, I I'm in the industry. Offer to help them, right? You don't always need, especially in the beginning, you don't always need to turn each each interaction into a transaction. Okay? When you help people, they will remember it. You don't have to fix this stuff. Just go look at it. Just give them some advice. Just, just tell them what you think. Then leave your card with them. Tell them, hey, you know, if you, ever, if, if you ever can't get your guy out here quick enough, I live right around the corner. Okay? It's not about how to, how to buckshot mass market to everybody. What, what you need when you're getting started, you need that first customer that becomes your advocate. That first person that you do such a great job for, that they want you to succeed. They 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 fall in love with your story about how you know you got you know two kids at home and this is what you want to do and you love the industry. That people eat that up. They will love. They want to hear your story. And that's that's one of the ways to get your foot in the door there. Residentially, 
Uh, the best way to, to get started is in a, I, this is what I tell people never to do once you once you got your business going. It's your friends and family, right? People that you know. When, once you got your stuff established, don't work for friends and family. <laughs> I mean, help them, but don't do it for money because that's uh, <laughs> they'll ruin every Christmas, so or Thanksgiving or whatever the holiday might be. Um, but yeah. It, and, and then remember who, who it is you're doing work for, right? You're working in somebody's home. That, that's their castle. And they may not take care of their castle, but it's their castle. So it doesn't matter how, how, how they take care of their house. It just doesn't, I don't need to describe it. You're going to see something. Uh, you still put the shoe covers on. You still never set your tools on an appliance. You know, it's all these little things that you might not even do at your own house, but for them, you're going to do it for them because each customer is going to see how, per how your brand is perfect, how you're respectful, how, how you're the type of company that they want to tell their neighbor who they know had a bad experience with a different guy, hey, you, you really got to give this guy a call it, or this gal a call. You know, they, they really took care of me. I'd refer them to anybody. You know, just like I was telling Brian about my chiropractor. My chiropractor is great. I'd refer him to anybody. I have no doubt in his ability to take care of someone. Earlier tonight, when I said what I said about this school and about this program, I meant it. Like, you guys are in a fantastic program if you're going to school here for HVAC. I don't know, I'm sure their electrical is good too, but I've, I've seen what they do, it's good. And I've seen, I'm not gonna say the other school's names on camera, but I've seen some of the other programs. They don't even have gas tied to the furnaces. How do you train somebody on how to do a combustion analysis if you don't have fuel going through the system, you can't. So when you hear guys like myself, Brent, and Mike talk about WCC and say how fantastic it is, how does that make you feel about your decision to be here? Does it make you feel a little better, a little more confident, like you, a good investment? That's what you want your customers to say about you. That is the most powerful marketing that you can do, is building that brand and getting, becoming known for being the person that does the job right. And I'll say this, if you do the job right, you can't name your price, but you can pretty much name your price. If people trust you, I mean, I, what I would say is you have to be fair. Like, you, that, there's nothing to be gained by taking advantage of a customer just because you can. But like this stuff, that's real money. All those things you guys wrote on that board, that is real money. And when you're running your own business, you will, you'll know exactly, I mean, you'll know more than ever that, that that's money, each one of those things you choose to invest in that build value in your company, that's stuff that, that's money you could put in your pocket. So when you're doing the right job and you're taking care of people, charge what you're worth, okay? And don't be afraid to do that. So, advertising. It's my least favorite part of marketing, but it is necessary. There's so many places you can spend your money, so many. It'll make your head spin. Um, you know, I'm going to tell you right now that I think if I was starting a business, I would probably, if I, it was just me and like a couple of my friends or whatever it was, I would use social media all day long and that's all I would do until I, you know, until I reached a point where I needed something else to grow. Because in social media, it's a tool that when, like 10 years ago, I would have dreamed of having something where not only can I reach a specific audience for a low cost, and I can pick the demographic, geographic, all these different things. I mean, when you pay Facebook, you can actually tell them, I want to talk to people who bought Audis last week. And they'll find the audience of people who either purchased or talked about an Audi, or whatever it is. I want to talk to people that are into gas grills, or whatever it is, and they got to be within five miles of me, and they got to be in an income range of this amount. It's incredible. That is such a powerful tool. I'm not a giant fan of tech, but from a business perspective, the, the tools that they give you access to, it's incredible. And then remember we just talked about, we talked about getting people to um, love and rave about your business, getting them to you know, want to talk about you. Well, that advertisement, uh, that, that vehicle for advertising, it allows them to become fans liking your page and get them to engage, and you can continue to have conversations with them throughout the year where their friends see the conversations, and they can share and promote your business, and it's like, 
It's like being able to pass a business card to somebody in Celine while we're sitting here in the room, and before you leave the room, that person's already contacted your business and they're getting, they're getting a, a lead set up. These tools that you guys have in front of you are incredible. They're incredible. And don't be overwhelmed by, I don't use Facebook, I don't know how to do this or that. It's super simple, and if you reach out to them, they'll help you with it. Okay? Um, yeah, so you, you can actually build an audience now. Some of the other ones, uh, you know, there's all the, all the traditional stuff is still out there, television, radio, newspaper, if you wanted to. There, every community has some kind of a publication, like the Shopper's Journal or whatever, where you can put coupons in it. Um, I, you guys can speak to how you feel about it, but I'm not a super big fan of coupons. Okay? They're just, look, if you're, if you're charging a fair price, you shouldn't have to discount your work, first off. And if you are discounting your work, it's, it's got to be for a legitimate reason, right? It's got to be because we, this, this industry has shoulder months. So we talk about, you know, uh, how much you got to charge. Well, when, the, when it's really cold, we have, we're blessed in this industry because the weather drives people to our doorstep, okay? That's something this industry has that not many do. But there's also those months of the year where the weather is not going to drive anybody to your doorstep. And sometimes then, that's when it, you might find it's appropriate to throw something out there where, hey, you know, this is our special. This is what we're going to do. But you gotta, you got to stick to your guns on that. And you can't, you don't, you don't want um, to get in that game of where when someone confronts you about your price, you let them tell you what the price should be or you just come down to whatever the price they want is. And, it, and it's not because the dollar amount so much, it's because when you are willing to lower your price no matter what, that customer will start to question in the back of their mind, well, what's the real number, right? Like I had the um, experience of buying windows five years ago and one of the largest window companies around, you know, and they're on television all the time. They came out and this poor salesman, he was in my house for like an hour and a half. And he brought windows in, and he was jumping on them and doing all this crazy stuff. And I had, it just so happened I was having a dinner party, and, like, my in-laws were coming over, and his kids started showing up. I'm like, hey, man, you kind of, you got to go, you know. Like, <laughs> we're going to have dinner. We've been here for two hours. He says, well, hold on, hold on a second. Let me just do something for you. And he, he, he get, pulls out this spreadsheet with all these numbers. He's like, okay, I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to give it to you for this price. It was half. The windows went from twenty-four thousand to eleven. I was like, "Get the f out of my house!" You know, like, come on, seriously. Like, if you guys, if you guys are out there, and you, and you, <laughs> and you do something like that, all that brand equity that you built, and being someone that they can rely on, trust. You know, it's quality work. It's a good price. Goes out the window. And it's a lot harder to build that trust back. In fact, it's pretty impossible than it is to gain it in the first place. So just on the whole coupon thing and discounting, just be careful. You don't, you don't have to do that. You know, you have to charge what you have to charge to stay in business. Um, other things, that, and this is stuff my sales team does that I would highly recommend. We buy really inexpensive, in fact, we had them printed. They're little thank you cards, okay? And they've got the logo on it, so it's branded. And it just says thank you. It's super simple. Every time we even run a sales call, we didn't sell anything. They didn't buy anything from us, nothing. Every salesman has to write thank you, and they have to write something that homeowner said to them that's personalized on the thank you card, and they got to drop it in the mail the same day. So that within three days, that customer gets something that says, hey, thank you, Mr. Homeowner, for letting me come in your house. It was a real pleasure meeting you. I really like your dog. I got the same kind of dog at home. Something simple like that. I'm telling you, you do this stuff, and it's going to increase your closing rate going to increase the amount of business that people do with you because, once again, no one else did it. No one else asked where to park. Nobody said thank you for just being able to come over and give a free estimate. And this stuff is cheap. It's so cheap. It's, uh, what is it, 50 cents for 60 cents for a stamp and maybe it was 40 cents for the card. These, these things will create wealth for you. you got to do them consistently. Okay. Um, another thing, uh, I might have to, I might cover this in another page. I'm going to slow my roll here. So I, if I get talking, I can totally go off on a tangent. I wish somebody here had my, my slideshow on them so they could say, Johnny, get back on track. 
running off here. So what makes a good advertisement? So let's say you are going to spend some money. You've decided, I'm going to run an ad. I'm going to spend 400 bucks or whatever you've got. Let's make it easy math. Let's say, because we'll, we'll come back to this when we talk about costs. So let's, we're going to spend $1,000 this month on a specific campaign. If you're going to run an advertisement, you want to make sure that it's, it's got something that attracts their attention. So I used to have a friend in marketing. He used to tell me, uh, if I sold cars, first thing I would tell somebody is, well, I'll sell, I, won't, I, don't, I won't sell you blue cars. And I said, well, why would you do that? And he goes, because. Well, first off, no one buys blue cars anyways. And two, as soon as you tell somebody they can't have something, they're going to want to know why and they engage it. Now, I'm not saying go in there and say, I'm not going to sell you this furnace. But what I'm saying is you have to come up with that phrase or something to say to somebody that's going to get them to engage with what you've said. Because that, when, if you ever look through one of those coupon books or go through a magazine or look at ads, it is like whitewash, whitewash, whitewash. Like, it's really hard. And then you might be flipping through, and all of a sudden one grabs you. When you're doing that, take a minute Step outside of what you're doing because you're probably sipping on your coffee, going through the mail, whatever, and take a look at that ad. And then look at the ads around it. Try to, try to realize why you stopped on that, right? There's, there's training and advertising everywhere around us. We're bombarded by thousands of messages. Well, it's probably hundreds of thousands of messages every day right now. If you want yours to be heard and you don't want to just flush $1,000 down the toilet that month, you have to think of something that's relevant to people that's going to get them engaged. It's usually a question, right? It's usually some form of a question as your, as your headline. And always make sure, you know, make sure, I personally, dogs, pets, faces, don't, uh, I shouldn't say don't, because do, do what you feel is right. But if you're advertising, don't put furnaces on your advertisement, like a picture of a furnace. Most people don't even know what that is, you know? Put a picture of somebody that's enjoying themselves, like in front of a warm fire, and then then put the word furnace next to it, or put the put the word comfortable, or put the, you know attach it to an experience. It doesn't. It's counterintuitive, right? You're like, I wait. I sell furnaces. I want to make sure they know I do furnaces. People's attention gets attracted to images that they think are attractive and and makes them feel good. Doesn't matter. I'm not traveling anywhere this year. I still look at every stinking Carnival Cruise ad that goes past me because, man, would I like to be on that cruise. So that's the way the brain works. The other thing is you can't make an opportunity, right? I mean, not, not with integrity anyways. How are you going to create an opportunity? You're going to go in someone's basement with a saw? I'll be done in a second, you know? You can't. It's, their equipment's either broke or they have a need or it isn't. So 90% of the time, because people don't buy furnaces and air conditioners once a year, 90% of the time, everything that you're doing to communicate with your potential customer, it's about creating a conversation, getting them engaged so that they think about you. It, it, so, I mean, I, my kind of rule is like, especially with social, I'll put probably four to five posts out that have nothing to do with selling them anything at all. It'll have to do with some kind of piece of information that they could use, right? A lot of homeowners don't know when to change their filters. They don't know how to take care of their water filters. Uh, you know, you can give them simple tips like, hey, you know, just remember to check them when you set the clocks back, when you set the clocks forward. They really should check them more than that, but just, you know, you give them these little pieces of information, and then they start to think, well, those guys helped me out, even though you really didn't do anything, you know? That's the kind of stuff that you want to do. If you are, I mean, if, you're, if you become helpful, if you can become like a resource for somebody, if your website, instead of trying to tell people like what they, uh, you know, how you sell furnaces and what your coupons are all the time, and you fill it with educational information about how to take care of their humidifier, how to look out for this problem, how to, how to be safe with carbon monoxide, how to do all these little things, how to clean their gas grill if you wanted to. It could be anything. Fill it with stuff that they need. And then when they need what you do, they're going to remember you, okay? You don't have to talk about how to fix furnaces all the time, but you do have to become somebody that they, that they uh, look for and depend on. So as you, as the, uh, another thing in marketing, another super, super important thing to do is every customer you get, and I don't care if you've only had one or you've had 10 or you've had a couple, 
without, without Prime, collect and record as much information as you can. Always get their email address. Always get their phone number and their cell phone number if you can. Um, which I don't think many people have landlines anymore. But get their whatever their best contact number is. And have that somewhere. If you don't have like a software package or anything like that, that's okay. Microsoft Excel is great. And you can create a real simple spreadsheet with name, address, you know, telephone number, email, what, what service they used. And most of those Excel spreadsheets, when you get to a size where you can actually have a CRM, you can just import them, import, export your entire customer database. When you get, when it's slow, you're going to really appreciate that you have that because then you can send, you know, it, once again, it doesn't have to be an advertisement, but you can send information to them. If you want your customers to remember you, they need to see your brand a bare minimum of seven times per year. And ideally, you want them to see you 12 times or more per year. Now, if you think about that, you don't want to be bombarding somebody with offers 12, 14, 20 times a year. Because they'll, they'll block you. They'll, they'll be like, this guy, it's like spam at that point. But if you can find conversations to have with your customers 12 times a year where you're giving more than you're taking, I'm telling you, you're going to win at this game. You're going to win at this game. You know, I was thinking about when you were saying that 70%, which is 100 that might even be low as far as to who fails. But I will say this. If you have that entrepreneurial spirit, if you, want, if you want to run your own life, if you want that financial freedom, like if you really want, like and you can taste it, like this is, I'm not, I'm, there's, I got to do this. You will succeed. Forget those statistics. You put your nose to the grind. You do whatever it takes. Maybe you do fail once. I've failed in business before. But if you don't quit and you got that in your gut, that fire where you know I'm going to do this, I guarantee you you guys are going to make it. Don't ever let someone tell you you're not going to make it. But you just can't ever quit. And you got to be smarter than that. Like the stuff that we're talking about up here, what do you guys think? Maybe one out of ten if you use all this stuff? I mean... It's a recipe, and it's not a recipe that's top secret. Like guys like us, we share it because like, just like Mike said, we want this industry to be better. The more people that are out there doing business like what you guys want to do, treating customers right, giving a lot of value, the whole industry rises up. It, it becomes better for all of us because we can all ch we're not competing with guys that are you know, cutting their prices and just trying to be the cheapest guy out there. We can all live a good life, and, all, and our industry gets a good name for having quality people out there that do a good job. <clears throat> Excuse me. But yeah, don't, it, it, you know, it's like, uh, you know, guys that make it, entrepreneurs, they're like the Navy SEALs of the, of the uh, you know, the economy. Because the, the thing that makes a Navy SEAL make it through buds isn't always, it's certainly not always their physical prowess. Those guys are all physically fit. It's some, if you ever listen to them or if you ever talk to one, when they went in, they were never going back. My first business mentor told me commitment's like, a real commitment is like jumping out of an airplane. There's no getting back in the plane. When you've really committed to something, there is nothing that will stop you from getting to that. If you take tools like what these guys are sharing with you, some of these ideas, and then most importantly, your own good ideas based on these principles that we're talking about, because each of you has something unique to you. And if you can find how to bring that out of yourself, that creative side of yourself, to apply that to your business, it's just the way the world works. Like, uh, you know, I personally believe in God, but if you don't, it still works the same. If you put that out there, people that want what you are, and you're true, and you're honest and sincere and authentic, they will find you. And they will come into your life. And you'll create business relationships that are so fulfilling. It's, a, it's an amazing experience. Now, I really want that for all of you. I really do. Uh, let's see. Yeah, other stuff real quick when you're collecting information. If you're with a client, let's say they share something with you like an anniversary date or anything like that. So I had a salesman that worked for me. He was a dear friend of mine. He was so good at this. He would, like, he, would, he would write stuff down. Let's say you know, a customer says, oh, we just celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. When he left the house, he'd program into his iPhone, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, you know, Ryan's anniversary, and he'd put that date on it. And then he might leave a note to what he did there. They bought a furnace or whatever it was. A year later, 
he would send them either a text message or an email or a card that said, hey, happy anniversary, as if he was a part of their family. This guy got more referrals than anybody I've ever known. And let's face it, like what he did, it makes it fun. It makes it so that like all of your customers kind of become like, you know, it's like a big community. They're all people that you sincerely care about and would do anything for. And when you, when you behave that way, when that's your marketing strategy is I'll do anything for my customers because I know they put food on my plate and my employee's plate, they will, they will, they'll reciprocate that. Like you literally get what you put out. And that's what, that's what all this branding stuff is about. Every, all these actions. Who, are we out of time? She asked me to go on as long as I could, so I was going to. All right. Sure. I got one more thing with marketing that I got to talk about, and that's repeat business versus referrals, farming versus hunting. Hunting takes a lot of energy. You have to be aggressive. You have to go out. You have to spend money. You have to spend resources, and you have to go get that food and bring it back. Farming, which is what we're talking about right now, planting seeds all the time. That they're not transactions. You're not, you're not trying to get money right this second every single time. But if you become a farmer, then you just get to go and pick the food. It's nice and easy. It's there when you need it. You can store it. You can have it when you want it. And I, I'll tell you right now, I've done the hunting. It's fun. When you win, it's awesome. When you do the farming, it's rewarding. You get to build things. You get to have a legacy. It's much more worthy. Managing costs, we'll skip that because he covered it. And, uh, uh, you know, cost per lead, we could do that a different day. But I just want to say thank you all very much. I can't tell you how much I get out of being able to present for you, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Brian.